Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, uh, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. church family great to see you all here easily best dancer for this service every time we do dollar sunday is kim right <laughs> way to go hey uh how many of you were part of better together yesterday how awesome was that we had so many people participating what an incredible day of serving with other churches in our community uh, real fast, as an introduction, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and we are starting a brand new series today, and I'm really excited about what's going to happen over the next three weeks, and then Easter Sunday is kind of the, the culmination of what we're doing. At the end of the day, you just kind of saw that, that thing up on the screen that we call that a bumper, kind of like gives me time to walk up here. We're all going to be talking about stories, and, and the fact is that each of us in this room has a story. And your story is powerful. And listen to this. Your story needs to be told. You were given your story so that you could share it with other people. If you think about the concept of a story, think about this for a moment. We all love a good story, don't we? If somebody were to get on stage right now, maybe sit in a nice little like wingback chair, put on a fireplace, open up a book and start reading a story, what would you do? You would lean in, right? You would want, like, you're, you would pay attention, you would focus, because we all love to be told a story. Stories are just captivating. They're, like, one of my favorite stories of all time is the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Just the idea of four normal people, four normal kids, uh, playing, you know, hide and seek and whatever, and they end up in, through this coat, this storage container, into another world. How cool is that, right? They end up of becoming princes and princesses, and there's just so many cool things that happen within the story. And stories captivate our minds, they captivate our attention. They really, if you think about it, stories help us learn more about the way like we interact with things, and it helps us process through like emotions and sad things and happy things and funny things and all the things that happen. Stories kind of pull all that together and help us kind of learn more about ourselves and more about the world around us. We, listen, we love stories. We pay $15 to sit into a dark room for two hours and have someone tell us a story, right? It's called a movie, right? We stay up till two in the morning sometimes, allowing Netflix to tell us one story after another after another. We call it binge watching, right? We love stories. My girls love stories. They like to come and sit on my lap. This happens all the time at my house. And usually the first thing they say once they're on my lap is, Dad, Tell me a story, right? What they're usually wanting is a story about when I was their age, maybe, a story from my childhood, or maybe a story about when they were younger. Sometimes they'll bring me a book and say, tell me this story. Your stories are lame, you know? Uh, <laughs> but they love stories, and we all do. Stories are just kind of a really important part of, of how we learn more about ourselves and more about the world around us. You know, we... Uh, you don't have to be in church very long to know all the, you know, the popular Bible stories, right? You, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Daniel and the lion's den, or, you know, all just the incredible stories of, 
uh, all throughout Bible, uh, throughout the Bible that we learn. The, the story is full of, or sorry, the Bible is full of stories. Your history class that you go to is, is basically a big story of where we, we came from, and stories are a really big deal. And I, I want to, um, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind for a moment, and then we're going to change gears. I want to ask you a question and think about this for, for a moment. Imagine that you have a friend that you've been friends with for two years, and you talk to them on a regular basis. Let's say at least every other day you guys are talking about things that are going on in your life. Maybe this is a coworker for you. Maybe this is someone that's in the waiting room while your kids are like at dance class, or maybe it's I don't know, maybe it's someone that you, is, you, you, you constantly see in your neighborhood while you're walking or whatever. Imagine it's someone that you've known for two years, and two years into knowing each other, you find out for the first time that they're married and have kids. That would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? Like how in the world, every time we get together and we're talking about the good and the bad, the ups and the downs, the hard stuff that's coming up in our lives and the things that make us cry and the, you know, all the, just the things that we're, we're talking about, how could it have gone two years without me knowing that you are married and have kids? Like how has that just not come up? I think all of us would say that's a bit odd. We would wonder like, sounds like they're not really excited about being married or having kids something they're maybe trying to hide and not mention. And yet the same thing is true for us a lot of times as followers of Christ. We have people who we interact with on a daily basis that two years down the road, they still have no idea that the, the biggest part of your story is not the fact that you one day made a decision to marry someone or that you made a decision to have, start a family or have kids, but it was, it was the decision in my life, the thing that's most important about me, Listen, I love my wife. I'm really glad I married her. I love my kids. I'm really glad that we have them, right? But the, the thing about my story that sets apart, that makes all those, the rest of those things kind of look like minor kind of side stories is the fact that I gave my life to Jesus. So how odd is it that if I have friends in my life who I interact with regularly that would say, hmm, I never knew that about you. Like, is that, that's, that should be more odd and I wanted to just kind of make that comparison because the truth is that all of us have a story. All of us have people that we talk to on a regular basis. All of us are sharing our, our interactions and our daily ups and downs and all the things that are going on in our lives. Don't you think that the most important part of your story ought to be a part of the story that you're telling, which is the fact that you are, those of you who've committed your life to Christ, you are a follower of Jesus. That should be something that is woven into your story and, and the, the major part of your story and is part of your conversations that you're having on a daily basis. You know, kind of a, a quick thing that I've noticed, um, just quickly to mention this. I, have you ever noticed that when I was younger, it was normal within church circles to say, I got saved, to use the word saved. And now for some reason that seems to be a bit cliche, like we don't say it that way anymore. We now say, I've given my life to Christ, or I'm a, I'm a Christian, or we have other ways of saying that same thing. But I want you to know, just briefly, that there is no better way to describe what happened to you the moment you gave your life to Christ than I got saved. I was lost, and then I was found. In one, one passage that kind of highlights this, in, in Psalm 30, this is a Psalm of David, and the whole, I'm just going to show you the first three verses. I'm going to stop at one, a few spots and, and explain this. So this is David talking about how Jesus saved his life. And he says, I will exalt you. Let's pause right there. Exalt. Do you know what that means? Exalt means to, to speak highly of and think highly of. Right? So David is saying, listen, because of what I'm about to say, I not only think highly of you, God, but I will speak highly of you. I will talk about you. You are going to always be a part of my story. When I open up my mouth and share my story, you are a part of it. I exalt you. And here's what he says about his story. He says, Lord, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. I'm going to pause there again. I, um, I have my, my youngest daughter, Molly, had a milestone this week. We're really excited about this. Molly, if those of you who've ever gone to the YMCA, you know that in order to swim in the pool as a child, you have to 
you have to wear a, like a necklace around your neck. And the necklace tells the lifeguards whether or not they need to pay attention to you or not, right? And this week, Molly finally did her, her green band test and she passed, right? So Molly, all my girls are now full swimmers. A green band just tells the lifeguards, you know, pay attention to this one, not that one. She can, she can swim, right? Well, Molly finally passed her test. I want you to know this is a really big deal for Molly because Molly has been afraid for a, long, for a lot longer than my other kids of water. And it all goes back to a story. When we were vacationing uh, years ago up in New England, we were at this resort and they had a pool and the pool was too deep for her. But they had a bench, that, like a bench seat in the water that went all the way around the pool. So Molly would just kind of walk around there and she'd play on the edge of the pool. And that was fine. We were keeping a close eye on her until we weren't keeping a close eye on her. And at one point, I remember turning and Molly was no longer there on the bench seat playing with her toys. Molly had fallen or stepped off of the bench and was now at the bottom of the pool. And in that moment, it all happened very, very quick. It wasn't as maybe dramatic as I'm making it sound in this moment. But I know for her and for all of us, it was a very scary moment. I had to go down to the bottom of the pool, pick her up off of the bottom of the pool and bring her up. And she uh, very quickly started coughing and clearing the water and crying. And I just remember for a long time from that moment on, she had been very afraid of water. She wasn't ready to, to learn how to swim. She didn't want to go in the, in the pool. But here's the truth in that moment, that she was at the bottom, she was at the depths of the pool, and in that moment, I had to grab her out and draw her out of the depths and save her. She was, uh, and would have not survived if I had just left her to her own kind of figuring it out. I had to draw her out, I had to save her life and pull her up out of the water. And that's what's going on right here. It says, I exalt you, Lord. I'm going to tell everyone about you. You are part of my story because you saved me. You went to the depths and you lifted me up out of it. I was lost. And now I'm up out of the water and I'm breathing again. I'm alive and I'm saved. And he goes on and says, You did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called you for help and you healed me. Now you even see that, that we've been saved from a perspective of like a doctor who's saved you from a a disease or a sickness. David is saying figuratively, you have healed me from this disease called sin. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. What this verse literally is saying is, I was dead and now I'm alive. You've brought me back to life. You've spared me from going down to the pit. Now, if I were to summarize these verses, and here's what is ultimately being said here. What, what David is, is exalting, what he is why he is including God in his story is that he has been saved. His life has been radically changed because of Christ. And the truth is that all of us have, those of us who have made a decision to follow Christ, if you're in this room right now and at some point you decided, I want to follow Jesus instead of following myself, your story is similar to this. You have been saved. Your life has been spared. Your life is radically changed. And I want to encourage us in this series to exalt that, to include it in our story, to tell others and to think highly of God and to, th to tell others about how highly we, we think of that. Like we have the ability to include that in our story. Because the truth is that you have a story that others need to hear. I want to encourage you uh, to say this out loud with me. We're going to change it to, I have a story. You ready? Say it with me. I have a story that others need to hear. Because this is really the kind of the theme of what we're going to talk about today. And I want you to know that Satan does not want you to learn anything we're going to talk about today. It's going to be a very practical message. We're going to get a handout here in a moment. And you already have it. We're going to get it out here in a moment. We're going to talk through it. It's very practical and I want you to know this right off the bat. Satan doesn't want you to hear or learn anything that we're going to talk about today. So let's pray. Let's pray him out of this place and uh, just ask that God would bless our time together. God, I ask right now that you would allow this place to be distraction-free. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, we, uh, we, we, in your name, we command that Satan and his demons would be free from this place, that we would be able to learn the truth about 
what it is that you want us to share with others, what needs to be part of our story, how to prepare our story and write our story. God, we ask that you would show us the importance of a story and why this story is something that other people need to hear. We love you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to uh, real, real quickly show you one kind of powerful verse in Scripture that, that tells you why your story is so powerful. Uh, before, we, before we look at this verse, I want to set it up. In Revelations, uh, Revelation 12, okay, in Revelation 12, there is a, uh, basically an, an account of when, when Satan and his demons were, were kicked out of heaven. So this is like before uh, any of, you know, the earth was created. It kind of recounts back to when, when Satan didn't, you know, thought he was going to be in kind of fight against. There was a war against God, and God sent him and his demons out of heaven and to the earth. So that kind of is all covered. And then it says that Satan to this day and his demons are constantly acting as accusers of you. Like, that's what they do. Every day they're trying to make you stumble. They're constantly uh, accusing you, uh, telling you you're worthless, that you are, are you point, there's nothing valuable in your life. That's what's happening right now. And then we get to this, this place, this verse in, in verse 11, where we learn how all of that can be overcome. It says, and they defeated him, they defeated Satan by two things. By the blood of the lamb, Satan is defeated and by their testimony. That's what, it, what this verse is saying, is that Satan's plan to destroy your life, to mess you up, to accuse you on a daily basis, is destroyed simply because Jesus came and died on the cross. His blood was shed for you, and because of that, you have an out. You are no longer need to be accused. You can be seen as innocent in the eyes of God. Satan has nothing against you because of the blood of the Lamb. But then that goes on to the next step, and not only the blood of the Lamb, but also because of their testimony, because you and I have the ability to go out and open up our mouth and tell our story. That's what testimony is. It's a fancy word for story. Tell people, what was it about the blood of Christ on the cross? How does that make a difference in your life, and how can it make a difference in theirs? And through that testimony, Satan is defeated. So, you have a story that others need to hear. Number one, I want to share with you three things. If you want to take some notes, you can take it on the back of that worksheet. We're going to look at the other side of that worksheet here in a moment. You have a story that others need to hear. Number one, here's why. Your story reveals the power of Christ. Your story tells other people that Christ is incredibly powerful and can be pow have a powerful impact on their life as well. Your story points and reveals other people to the power of Christ. How many of you, um, remember, we're bringing our paper Bibles to church with us. How many of you brought your Bible today? Let me see it. Hold it up. All right, if you don't have a Bible with you today, I want to invite you to grab a Bible from the chair back in front of you because what we're going to do, I'm going to put up a, a passage, John 9, right here. I think it's on page 644. If you're using one of our chair back Bibles, uh, we're going to just turn. Go ahead and put that passage up on the screen for me. Uh, John 9, 1 through 25. Turn in your Bible to this. Instead of giving you all the verses, we're just going to turn there together in our Bibles. If you don't own a Bible, take that Bible you just grabbed and write your name in it. Let me show you this, this story. This is a story from Scripture, a true story about Jesus healing a man that was born without sight. He wasn't able to see. His entire life, he was blind. All right? John 9, verses, uh, we're going to look at kind of 1 through 25. I'm going to skip around a little bit. Here's, what, here's how it starts. Verse 1. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. So this man had never been able to see before. As his rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? I love right here in this moment, the disciples aren't really concerned about, hey, can you do something about this? They're just wondering, why is this guy not able to see? Is it because he's a bad dude or is it because his parents were bad people? Why does this guy have this, this sight issue? And then Jesus answers in verse 3. It says, it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered, 
This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. I want you to know right now that verse 3 in and of itself could be an entire sermon series. What Jesus is saying right here is, hey, you know that, that really like, the kind of not cool thing that happened in this guy's life, the fact that he was born blind and for his entire childhood all the way into adulthood, he hasn't been able to see, he's been so unable to make a living that he's now begging on the side of the street. Why do you allow that to happen to him? Was it because of his sin or his parents? And Jesus says, let me tell you why I allowed that in his life this whole time. It was because, so this moment right here could happen. And the power in me could be revealed in this moment in what I'm about to do. Maybe God has you going through something right now in your own life and you're thinking, why am I going through this? Maybe God has a moment a month from now, 20 years from now, that he knows in that he's going to reveal his power in your story. But I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. All right, so let's skip down to verse 8. Here's what happens between there. He, Jesus makes some mud, and he places it in the man's eyes and says, go and go, get in the, uh, go take a bath, and you'll be able to see. And the guy does it, and he's able to see. In verse 8, it says, His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? It was so unbelievable, right, that some said that he was, and others said no, he just looks like him. In other words, it couldn't possibly be him. He's never been able to see a day in his life. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. So they asked him in verse 10, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud, spread it over my eyes, and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and I washed, and now I can see. And so what happens uh, between here and and kind of the end of this passage is now this man is able to see, and he tells his kind of closest friends around him about what happened, and, and these people aren't really even close friends because some of them are like, I, I'm not sure if this is him, right? So he's just telling the people that are right around him. Now the Pharisees get all bent out of shape because, get this, somebody made mud on the Sabbath, right? Jesus bent down, and he he spit in the dirt and he made some mud and that is called work and nobody works on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees are kind of bent out of shape. They're, they're, they pull the man in. They start questioning him, trying to kind of get Jesus on something, right? And, and the man is there and he says, what happened? And the man says, I, I, don't, I don't quite know what happened. I don't have all the details. And that, this kind of conversation keeps going. And they pull the man's parents into the conversation. So now the blind man's parents are there. Remember, this blind man is an adult. He's been blind since childhood. He is now a grown man. And the parents know that the Pharisees mean business, right? So they say, uh, listen, we don't want anything to do with this. You just deal with our son. You let him figure this out. So the parents pull themselves out of the conversation and they pull the son back in. The Pharisees are continuing to question him. And then we get to this really powerful verse in verse 25. This is what the blind man says when, they're asked, when he's asked again about what happened. He says, I don't know whether he is a sinner. In other words, I don't know anything about Jesus, really. I don't really know much about this guy, but here's what I do know. But I, but I know this, I was blind, and now I can see. You hear how simple this man's story was? Listen, here's, I, don't, I don't know whether or not Jesus was a serial killer. I don't know whether or not he's a good guy or a bad guy. I don't know if he's there. I don't know, I don't know him. But what I do know is I couldn't see, and now I can. That was his story in a few words right there. Here's what I know. That guy changed my life forever. Man, what a powerful testimony. What a powerful story to share. There's another a story in the book of Acts uh, chapter 4. There's, there's a situation where Peter and John, they're going around and they're, they're healing people in the name of Jesus. And they're, they're going out and they're doing amazing things in the name of Jesus, okay? And then the Pharisees, again, are all upset that these guys are getting attention and that they seem to be doing things outside of the, the normal way things are done. So they call them in to question them. So now, 
uh, Peter and John are being questioned by the Pharisees, and they start telling them their story. Let me tell you about my story. I was lost, and, and now I'm found, and, and Jesus does this, and Jesus has done this through me, and they start sharing their story. And here's what we see in, in, in Acts 4.13. It says, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. In other words, they were amazed that these two guys, in a very scary situation, were willing to tell the full story. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. They also recognized them as the men who had been with Jesus. Here's what this means. If you've ever thought to yourself, listen, I, I'm not trained in scripture. I've never been to seminary. Like, talking about my faith is kind of scary for me because I don't know how to answer questions that might come back to me. So when it comes to sharing stories, Matt, I'm just going to bring them to church, and why don't you just tell your story over and over again? Because I don't really feel comfortable sharing my story. What we see right here is, is they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they could see that Peter and John were ordinary guys with no special training, no powerful understanding of, of something that they're just, just ultimately they're just sharing their story, and their story made it obvious that these guys had been in the presence of Jesus. You and I have stories, and our story reveals, listen to this, back to number one, point number one, your story reveals the power of Christ. When people see you share your story with boldness, when they see you share it with confidence, when they hear the, the, what happened in your life and how Jesus has changed you, it will, every time, reveal the power of Christ in your life. You have a story, listen, that highlights a powerful, life-changing God. Number two, you have a story that others need to hear. Number, uh, the, the second point is your story points others to the source of hope. The reason I capitalize uh, the is because I believe, right, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus is the ultimate source of hope. And I believe that all around the world, all around your life, all around your office place and your neighborhood, there are people who are hopeless. There are people that do not understand uh, why they can't find joy and hope in their lives. And you and I, we have the source of hope. Uh, many of you, if, if you hear me tell my story, and you will during this series, um, you know, my story has a really big turning point in it. And, and those of you who've heard my story before know that when I was a sophomore in high school, I got called out of class randomly one day in school, and my brother and sister and I were all there together wondering why, and we found out in a moment when my dad came into the room sobbing that my mom had passed away that morning from a heart attack. And I, I, that story of how that moment in my life changed my life. The, the, and I continue usually when I tell my story. Uh, that I went home that day. We got into a friend's car and they drove us to our house and my mom's body was still in the house. They were waiting for us to, to see her and say goodbye. And when we pulled into the driveway, my youth pastor was there in that moment. And he gathered me and my brother and I, my sister and he, he huddled us all together in a moment of prayer and he prayed over and over again over us. God, grant them peace. God, grant them peace. I remember thinking like, why does he just keep saying the same thing over and over again? But in the, the, that moment, as he was praying it, I remember feeling every time he said it, just the sense of uh, overwhelming peace just coming over my life. I, I'm at, at the same time confused and angry and sad and frustrated. But I also was like, God is good. God is good. I know what he's doing. I don't like this, but I trust him. I remember just this peace that was given to me in, those, in the, that moment of prayer was, was powerful, and it, it changed the way I interacted with God in that healing process after my mom's death. And that is a part of my story, because when I tell my story, and I talk about how that was like this pivotal point where, where I had to take my faith and make it my own. It could no longer be my mom's faith. It had to be my own faith. See, my story points 
to the source of hope. My story, when I tell it, reminds other people that my, my, I might have thought my hope was found in other things or in other people, but I realized through my story that the source of hope, the source of fulfillment, the source of joy in my life wasn't a person, wasn't a place, wasn't a thing. It was my relationship with, with Jesus. In Mark 5, there's a, another story where Jesus is walking along and he, he sees there's a man who's demon-possessed. And he's so demon-possessed, the Bible says that the demon actually calls himself legion because legion is a word for many, right, for thousands. And, and we know that he probably was possessed by over 2,000 demons, according to Scripture, because when Jesus steps in and heals this man and casts the demons out, he casts them into some pigs and it says that there's about 2,000 pigs in that moment that threw themselves over a cliff. So he, cast the, the, he takes this demon-possessed man and he heals him. He saves him. Let's not be afraid of that word. He saves this man's life. And now this man's life is changed. And what happens in Mark 5, where you can read this story, it says in verse 18, it says, as Jesus was now done, right, he's getting on his boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. I love this, this example right here. When Jesus changed your life, you notice how this man who's, whose life had just been changed by Jesus is now saying, my life is so changed by Christ, I want to do what he's doing. I want to go with him. Can I be, uh, wherever you go, I go. I'm your man. Is that the way Jesus is working in your life? Are you like, Jesus, whatever you want from me, I'm going to do it. You've saved me. I owe you a life debt. And that's what this guy is saying. I, I was possessed and now I'm not. And he says, can I go with you? Begged him to go with him. And Jesus says this, no. Go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you. In other words, go home and tell people your story. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region. He must have had a really big family. He started off to visit the 10 towns of that region and he began to proclaim. He began to share his story with anyone who would listen. He began to tell a story over and over and over again, the great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed at what he told them. In other words, he went and told his story, a story filled with hope. And he said, Jesus is the source of hope. Jesus is the one who changed my life. Your story not only reveals the power of Christ, but it also points people to the source of hope, which is Jesus Christ. See, the truth is, we live in a really hopeless world, and I believe with all my heart, listen, I believe that people who do not have a relationship with Christ they may claim otherwise, but I know deep down in every soul there is an emptiness and a void for anyone who hasn't given their life to Jesus. And when we have an opportunity to share and point people to the source of hope, the only thing that's going to fill that void, people are hungry to hear it. Here's another thing, uh, the third and, and final for you have a story that others need to hear. Your story invites others into the greatest story ever lived. Your story invites others into the greatest story ever lived. How many of you, let's just kind of do a math problem here. How many of you know five people that don't have a relationship with Jesus? As far as you can tell, they don't know Jesus. I assume that's everyone in this room, right? Unless you live under a rock. Like, you, you know five people who don't know Jesus. That represents on a Sunday morning here at ACC 4,000 people throughout our community that don't know Christ. And sometimes we get so focused internally as a church that we're like, hey, let's just get together and kind of do our little holy huddles and spend time together. Uh, but the truth is that there's 4,000 people at least that we just figured out through a math problem that we know that desperately need to hear our story. Check this out in Luke 15, 7. It says, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. 
In other words, if you want to know what really starts the party in heaven, what really brings the joy, what really pumps the music and gets the dancing going on, it's not when the 99 of us gather together in our little huddle. It's not when you and I spend time praising and worshiping God. Listen, he loves that. That does bring joy. But it says what brings more joy in heaven is when that one person who is outside of faith in Christ comes to know Jesus. You have a story that others need to hear. And we need to get out of the comfort zone of telling each other our stories and learn how to prepare a story so that we can go out into this broken world and tell our story of of hope and power and ultimately that story that points people to the answer they're looking for, which is Jesus. The problem is, is that before you can tell your story, you need to know your story. Right? You need to know how to tell someone your story. In fact, check out this verse in, in 1 Peter 3.15. It says, You must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, what are those three words? Always be ready. Always be ready. What this verse is saying is that you need to know your story. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, why do you have so much hope? My life is hopeless, and I would love to know the source of hope in your life. What is it about you that causes you to smile, that causes you to find joy, that causes you to be so different than everyone else around me? What is going on? In that moment, are you ready in that moment to tell your story? Do you have it? Do you know it? Can you share it? And what I want to do with the uh, negative three minutes we have left is I want you to pull out this, this worksheet. Uh, you were given it, uh, hopefully, on your way in, in your bulletin. If you don't have one right now, uh, on your way out, tell someone and we'll give you one. But your story has three parts. I want you to know this. If you're a follower of Christ, your story has three parts. It, it's these three. There's before Christ, then Christ, and since Christ. And what we want to invite you to do, in fact, uh, we, we want to start thinking through some of these, these, these prompts. You'll notice right here at the top, it says the following prompts are merely suggestions. I don't need you to take this and feel like this is your script. These are just some ideas to help you prepare your story. And your story should have three parts. If you're like me, by the way, and you're in this room and you've been a Christian as far, as, far back as you can remember, your before Christ story is like mine. It's one sentence long. It's, I grew up in, in a home of, of God-fearing parents, and as far back as I can remember, I, I knew I needed Jesus in my life. That, that's my before Christ. It's not a super interesting one. But some of you have a very interesting before Christ, and these prompts can help you write down your story before Jesus was a part of it. And then you have then Jesus, right? So you're talking about what happened as you realize that, that Jesus was the source of hope. He was the, vo- the void filler in your life. And you get to tell people about Jesus and how he changed your life. You get to share the simple gospel. And then the last part, since Jesus, prompts you to really tell people about what's been happening in your life since you gave your life to Christ, that, that you're being transformed, that you look at things differently, that there's now a joy that wasn't there before. Whatever that looks like for you, my, my homework assignment for all of us this week is our What Now, God? And so as we put up our What Now, God, on the screen, remember this is a, a prayer that you're praying to yourself right now in this moment. God, what is it that you want me to do with everything we talked about today? What is it that I need to do with, with what Matt's been talking about? And I want to give you three things. Number one, I want you to take this home And I want you to write down your story. Now, now I know it's easy for me to just say, yeah, just go home and write down your story. And some of you are thinking, yeah, yeah, sure. I already know my story. I got it. I don't need to worry about that. Uh, I don't want you to to kind of get your way out of this. In fact, I want you to look at the person, maybe your spouse or a friend or someone sitting next to you and say, hey, when we get home, let's commit to doing this together. Go ahead. Make that commitment to each other right now. Hey, hold me accountable. When I get home today, let's just take a few minutes and I'm going to write down my story. Write it on a piece of paper. Write, type it if you want. Type it into your phone. I don't care. Write down your story. 
Number two, I want you to maybe practice one time reading that story or telling that story in a simple prayer to God, a prayer of praise. Man, I, I love when I can talk to God and say, God, you took me from this and you did this in my life and since then this has been happening. I'm so thankful for you. I want to give you a, a, a permission to pray your story as a prayer of praise to God this week. Find time to do that. And the last thing I want to challenge you to do is if you're in this room right now and you're thinking none of this makes sense to me, you're talking about a before Christ, a then Christ, and a since Christ, but I've never given my life to Jesus. My life is still in the phase one, act one part. I'm still searching for hope. I'm still searching for what's next in my life. I want to ask you if that's you, you could do something about that today. I want to invite you to, to be praying about that here as I pray in a moment, to be thinking about whether or not God would invite you to make that decision. And if that's you today, we're going to provide an opportunity for you to come and talk to someone on our staff or prayer team. You can come see me out by the lobby. I would love to talk with you. I want to invite you into that process and what that looks like. Let's pray together, church. Father, we are so thankful for the work that you're doing in our lives. Each of us in this room has a story. For most of us in this room, I believe our story has three parts. There's the part of our life before you were in it, and then there's a part where you entered into our story and you changed us, and then there was that third part where you are now working to continue to transform us and sanctify us. God, I also believe that there are some in this room that our story, uh, their story only has one part, that they have yet to give their life to you. And if that's someone in this room right now, then they understand that Jesus now is the source of hope. It's what they've been looking for. It's what they've been searching for. I pray that you give them the courage to invite someone on our team, someone on our prayer team, someone with the lanyard to be a part of helping them change their life. God, we are so thankful for the way you're working in and through us. I pray that you would help us to, to, to live up to telling our story, to writing it down together, to being ready for what's next, next week. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.